Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is John from Business Review, and I'll be your host today. It's our pleasure to have Smiths Interconnect with us today. We'll be presenting this webinar titled, Advanced Thermal Management for High Power IC Testing. Today's guest speakers are Rick Marshall, Global Business Development, Semiconductor Test, Tim Wooden, Product Line Manager, Semiconductor Test, and Queen Nguyen, Mechanical Engineer, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar platform on 24. You'll notice that this webinar is browser-based, so if you disconnect for any reason, please just click on the link that you received via email to rejoin the session. In order to ask questions, you can send them in via the questions widget. Just type them into the box at the top corner of your screen and click Submit. We'll allocate some time at the end of the session to address any questions or thoughts that you may have. Please use the yellow Help widget if you require any assistance and you can move, resize, and maximize any of the windows in front of you to get a better view of the slides. But for now, please allow me to welcome today's first speaker, Rick. Thank you, John. Uh, thanks everyone for joining today. We're really excited to be with you. Today we're gonna to be covering a range of solutions to cool down uh, IC test setups. We're gonna be focusing on system level test, functional characterization, and lab or benchtop development type environments. So here you can see our agenda for today. We're gonna to start off talking about some of the more traditional approaches such as heat sinks and fans, uh, but then we're gonna get into some technologies around heat pipes and vapor chambers to talk about how we can extend those traditional approaches. After that, we're gonna talk about liquid cooling approaches. Uh, many of these are being implemented for today's most challenging devices, um, chips like you know, really advanced graphics processors, network switch ASICs, and the new breed of artificial intelligence chips that are being applied for machine learning, deep learning in the data center. These, these chips are turning out to be just monsters for power. Uh, we're gonna talk briefly about active cooling systems, systems that can both push and pull heat uh, using a, a Peltier device. And then Quinn's gonna talk to us very briefly about some of the really radical new solutions that are coming up that include completely immersing the chip and its system into a liquid bath. And we definitely would like to make this session interactive, so we want to answer as many questions as we can. So please use this as a Q&A widget and submit your, your questions during the session. We'll answer as many as we can live uh, at the end of our talk. And anything that we don't get to today, we will for sure follow up uh, with, with an email. So we'd like to start off with asking uh, all of you attendees a couple of quick survey questions. Tim? Take this away, please. Yes, great to be here today. Thank you, Rick. You know, we, as Rick just mentioned, we'd like to start you off with a few survey questions. If you could uh, give us some feedback here. Uh, for our first question, we'd like to hear about your ICs. Uh, if you're working on testing digital SOCs, please share with us the typical or maximum power output for your device. Uh, you should be able to click uh, either the first box, which is less than 200 watts, uh, 200 to 350 watts, 350 to 600 watts, and greater than 600 watts. And, you know, this is a, some market analysis that we're trying to capture within the webinar. So Come on, Tim. I was going to be an auction. A chip, kit, a, chip kit, I, a chip can't draw 600 watts, can it? Come on, let's hear your 600 you watts. Know, yeah, we are sitting in rooms asking these questions, and we used to come back to the office. I would tell Quinn, Quinn, we got a request for over 600 watts. And she would look at me like I'm crazy, but today that's just starting to be normal. So uh, I'm curious to see what the answers are going to be here. All right, let's take a look. Oh, right. 46%. Yeah, we got we got a good number there, 350 to 600, which which actually matches our expectation, right, Tim? I mean, we're seeing a lot of activity in that level, but the greater than 600 watts is still kind of exotic, right? Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, I think that this is a, a, again, I just want to thank the audience for contributing here. You know, this is really good information for us, uh, and in a way for us to understand the market better. So, for the second question, uh, would you please tell us about your typical package size? In addition to total power dissipation, the package area matters a lot. Uh, as we'll discuss, the higher the power density, 
the bigger the cooling challenge. Uh, so question two, what is your upcoming IC package substrates? Uh, less than 30 millimeters squared, up to 50 millimeters squared, up to 70 millimeters squared, or greater than 70 millimeters squared? I know, and we have we do have a secret bet going on, Rick, Quinn, and I. So um, please help me win. Yeah, and, and this is important, Tim, because you know at, at say 300 watts, a smaller package is a much bigger challenge than a large package, right? Oh, uh, completely. You know, we we're just running into such a high performance mark on smaller devices, and we're trying to pull heat away from smaller and smaller surface areas it's 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 uh, been pretty challenging and i that. lost the Small k cup. Chips. i w i will send you the k pod cup of coffee i owe you rick All right. super okay so thank yeah, you everyone I, for the responses it's really interesting 350 watts sub 30 millimeter square package seems to be the sweet spot and uh, that that tracks with uh, what we're seeing we we are actually seeing a lot of packages at 70 millimeters square and larger and some exotics at, at over 100 but yeah again that's limited okay so to start us off tim's going to give us an overview of what's driving these increases um you know there's a lot of activity in seven nanometer and five nanometer from the big technology companies uh, from the big chip companies and these uh, new designs that are going into tsmc and samsung are absolutely exploding the transistor counts, right? It's not at all uncommon for us today to see 30 billion and 50 billion and you know over 50 billion transistors packed into one of these chips. And those just draw a huge amount of power. So uh, we're gonna start off by talking about uh, the test setup. So we'll give you an overview of what's driving this and we'll talk a little bit about the basics of the test setup. And then we're gonna jump right into air-cooled technologies. So Tim, tell us why, why this is happening. All right, great, thanks, Rick. So advances in high-end floating-point processing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence have led to a new class of devices that demand performance at all power costs. As a result, extremely high gate count devices are being designed that have incredibly high power draws. Uh, it's now normal for us to see ICs requiring 350 to 650 watts. And a little bit of history on this is around 2016, the majority of processors had single die architecture with 20 to 30 gigabit memory bandwidth, uh, which could dissipate anywhere from 50 watts for laptop to 90 watts for desktop. Following this, the processor memory bandwidth increased to around 80 gigabits per second or more than double previous generation. Along with this power, dissipation also doubled to 150 to 200 watts, often with multi-die architecture. Today we're seeing chiplet-based architectures where there's a large die for functional blocks, I.O., DRAM controllers, along with mul multiple smaller HBM, CPU, and GPU on the single substrate, uh, which is, as you can see, an uh, MCM device uh, in the picture on the right. Uh, the picture. I, uh, these chiplets can dissipate from 250 up to 350 watts, and it's just getting higher. Okay, so let's briefly go over the test setup now. Uh, for today, we'll mainly focus on system level tests, which is pr pretty similar in structure to engineering or bench setup. Uh, the system level test is the ability to test a device and a functional PCB. This setup consists of a functional PCB with a socket assembled to it. Inside the socket, there's spring probes that provide electrical connection between the PCB and the chip. Once the device is placed inside the socket, a manual loop lid is used to actuate the device downward and compress the probes into what we call the test state. Uh, in the diagram on the right, we actually outlined how heat is generated on both the top and the bottom of the chip. 
Uh, on the bottom side, the heat is dissipated by conduction, the PCB's copper ground planes, and then escapes into the environment by convection. Heat is also dissipated through the top side by conduction from the chip to a heat sink. The heat sink enables convection to remove the heat from the heat sink's larger surface area. And in this diagram, you can see the dye is represented in red, the substrate is represented in gray, and the heat sink in yellow. In this type of setup, we can typically ignore, ignore radiation. Uh, so we'll mostly focus on how the lid and its heat sink can dissipate heat by conduction and convection. So Rick, it's getting hot. Let's get started. All right, there you go, thanks too. All right, so to start off, we're gonna explain what we're doing today with heat sinks and fans, uh, which is quite a bit. We can, we can cool devices in the 200 to 250 watt range with just your traditional heat sink and fan setup, so we'll explain that. Uh, after we go over that, Quinn's gonna describe what we're doing with uh, vapor chambers and heat pipes to extend those solutions. Uh, and you know, here in the slide, you see a couple of today's modern graphics cards. Uh, anybody who's been chasing one of these down for the gamer in their, in their family knows that uh, it's very common nowadays to see vapor chambers on these graphics cards. We don't actually use vapor chambers that much in IC test setups, but we do use the vapor chambers close cousin, the heat pipe, quite extensively. And that's one of our, our big recent innovations here in the last couple of years is using heat pipes uh, to be able to extend air cooling upwards of 300, 400, 500 watts. So Quinn's going to go through that. Uh, and just to note that uh, today we're actually working on heat pipe designs where we're attempting to get up to about the 700 watt range. Over that, we have to look at some different solutions and we're going we're gonna to go through those. So let's, let's jump into air. Okay, so what you've got here is uh, we're showing you four CAD renderings. And I should note, we went with CAD drawings here rather than photos of the actual sockets, just to help you see more detail. Uh, on the upper left and in the, in the center uh, uh, upper slide here, you're seeing a 200 watt design. And in the lower right and the lower bottom, you're seeing a 250 watt design. So the first device, the 200 watt device, this is a 65 millimeter square package. And the challenge here was to dissipate 200 watts of power. Um, you can see that the, the heat sink and the fan pretty much cover the whole area of that 65 millimeter square package. And the simulation that we're showing, the colorized drawing in the middle there, is showing that we're targeting a case temperature of around 85 degrees C with 200 watts uh, power dissipation. And the simulation is showing that, that we're passing. Um, the heat sink resistance is pretty efficient. We're about 0.1 degree per watt. And uh, so, you know, this, this worked. This worked quite well for this particular application. Uh, I, I want to note here that uh, thermal simulations, like what we're showing you in this, in this drawing here, are really becoming important. In the last couple of years, we've dramatically increased the number of thermal simulations that we're doing for our customers uh, because we found that without doing a proper thermal simulation, it's really hard to predict whether or not your cooling solution is going to work effectively. So in addition to doing mechanical simulation for warpage, coplanarity, et cetera, as well as an electrical sim uh, simulation for signal integrity, crosstalk, et cetera, we're now also doing thermal simulations to show uh, airflow, liquid flow, power dissipation, et cetera. And, and that's where Quinn's expertise comes in. So she's going to talk to you a little bit about that. So um, the 250 watt example that you see down below, the brown colored heat sink, uh, the key thing we want to highlight here is that it's a much larger heat sink. So just going from 200 to 250 really explodes the size of the heat sink. Uh, in this case, the device is a little bit smaller. This is a 52 millimeter square package. Uh, but you can see that uh, number one, the size of the heat sink is much larger compared to the 200 watt heat sink. And this particular heat sink extends significantly beyond the, the XY boundaries of the chip package. Um, this heat sink design, it worked, but, um, you know, we joked, you see on the right, we have two fans on top of it. One of our engineers joked that when you turn this thing on, you probably want to step back and put your noise canceling headphones on because it sounds like a drone taking off. This was a, this is quite the beast. Um, you know, if you're sitting in a quiet room, maybe with a refrigerator in the corner or something, you're probably experiencing 50 dB of, of ambient noise. These things are pushing 60 to 80 dB of noise, so they really do get quite loud. Um, 
you know, one of the key considerations about having a heat sink this big is that in a lot of the system test applications that we see, designers really don't want to have things hanging over the board, right? In many cases, they want to have components that are close to the duct for impedance control. Uh, in other cases, they want to have test access points where they want to be able to put a probe down very close to the duct. And having a large heat sink like this that extends well beyond the package area sometimes is, you know, just not desirable. So, uh, you know, these solutions worked well for the customers uh, for whom we designed them, but you can see that as you get to 250 watts, and we're next going to talk about, you know, 350, 400, you start to have some design trade-offs. So, Quinn's going to show us some really cool stuff uh, uh, that can help to mitigate some of these trade-offs. Quinn, tell us about heat pipes and vapor chambers. All right. Thank you, Rick. Uh, it's great to be here today. So let us discuss about the vapor chamber and heat pipe. Um, recently, heat pipe or vapor chamber have gained momentum, uh, even though it has been around since the 60s or 70s. Um, but since there is increasing demand for effective cooling of higher power device, uh, it has gained more uh, momentum. So let us uh, look at the uh, um, image at the center of the page. Um, this is what a heat pipe uh, uh, look like and how it operates. So um, it is just a, a tube hermetically sealed and filled with uh, uh, working fluid. The material of the tube and the choice of the uh, fluid depend on the operating uh, range uh, of the temperature required. Uh, a little, a little bit to the left is an example of the heat pipe and, mm, that mm, mm, you see. So when the heat is entered into the uh, evaporator side of the heat pipe, the uh, temperature will rise. Once it's reached above the uh, working temperature of the fluid, uh, the fluid will turn into vapor. Uh, that vapor will carry the heat into the condenser area uh, where it is cooled back into liquid. Uh, the liquid is carried back to the evaporator by uh, the capillary action uh, of the, uh, from the uh, wicked internal structure uh, against the wall of the pipe. So as you can see, uh, for this pipe, uh, it's moved heat from one area to a remote sink where uh, heat is dissipated. Uh, to the far left uh, is an example of the vapor chamber. So vapor chamber is similar to a heat pipe. However, it's using a larger diameter pipe and, if, and it is flattened. Uh, since the, it is flattened, um, the heat is spread laterally and then a adjacent uh, heat sink will help dissipate the heat. Uh, for vapor chamber, it works best if it has a larger area. Therefore, it is not ideal uh, for um, um, SLT setup uh, where we want, uh, as Rick discussed earlier, we want the area of the lid to be as small as possible. So um, vapor chamber is not very beneficial in this application. For the heat pipe, because the pipe can easily bend Therefore, it is very beneficial for this application. So below, you see that uh, due to its bendability, the design flexibility is higher. We are able to fit a heat pipe into a smaller uh, lid. So in the picture below, um, as you can see in this picture is our um, typical lab setup uh, that we perform. Uh, we validate our lid every time uh, before we ship our list to a customer. So um, from this uh, specific test, um, it's so that um, this list can dissipate 300 watts and uh, keep the junction temperature at around 65 degrees C. Um, a little bit lower to the uh, right-hand side is a uh, um, simulation model that we have. And uh, in the simulation, when we um, run it, uh, it's so that we are capable of dissipate 300 watts 
and um, the measurement, uh, the simulation result is around 77 degrees C. So as you can see, there is a 13% difference between simulation and measurement. Hey, Quinn, I just got have a quick question for you. Is there, when, when you're running your simulations, are, and are you setting the lab temperature or the ambient air temperature to the temperature in the lab so that we can correlate it correctly? So um, unless uh, customers specify uh, we can set the ambient uh, temperature correlated to the temperature in the, in the lab so that um, the actual measurement when it come out, it doesn't have a very a big variation from the simulation. Great. So um, this is a, uh, in this image, uh, you see that uh, we have a uh, heat tight sink developed for a 600 watt uh, device. Um, the simulation saw that at 600 watt, uh, the case temperature is around uh, 74 degrees C. However, at the actual measurement is around uh, 58 degrees C. So heat pipes have higher thermal conductivity, therefore it can dissipate uh, heat better than the traditional heat sink, uh, and it can cool beyond uh, the 600 watts. Uh, as you recall, the lead design uh, for 250 watt device that uh, Rick um, discussed earlier, um, it's um, the 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 image uh, on the lower right hand side, uh, lower left hand side is uh, uh, is the heat sink. Um, that heat sink size is around uh, one uh, 140 by 90, 140 by 90. And then uh, as you can see from the heat pipe design, we use the fan um, 92 millimeter, and the distance from one fan to another is uh, around 140. So the size is the same, but the cooling capability is uh, almost double, more than double. Mm, because of the bendability of the pipe, um, uh, it allow us to raise the pin area higher uh, above the PCB uh, surface. So this freed up the space for uh, the uh, component to be placed around the device. And then uh, um, with the respect to the ergonomics, uh, the structure increased the fin surface area. So it allow us to use a larger fan, uh, which have bigger motor, and uh, thus the noise level is significantly lower. Uh, with respect to the um, uh, weight, since uh, it is not a big chunk of Copper, therefore, it is much uh, lighter. The cost for the uh, heat pipe, if you go for high volume, uh, 10,000 units or more, then the cost is very low. Uh, however, if you go for just a low volume, around tw uh, 10 or 20, then the cost is much higher. Uh, the higher cost is due to the uh, cool, uh, pooling required to um, Manufacturing the pipe, bend the pipe, um, um, manufacturing the fin and atta fin attachment. Uh, in the same note, um, the lead time for manufacturing and also designing is longer because we have to spend time for the tooling as well. Um, so now let's move on to the uh, liquid cooling, uh, Rick. All right, super. Thank you, Quinn. So at some point, air is just not going to cut it. Um, across the customers that we support, we see a surprising variation in attitudes towards uh, air cooling versus liquid cooling. Many of our customers just want to avoid liquid cooling at all costs. They, it's just anathema. They, they don't think that it's worth the hassle. You know, uh, it, some of our customers actually prefer to stay with air cooling because it eliminates any user input, right? They can deliver an air-cooled solution out across their organization and know that it's going to work consistently and reliably. Uh, in contrast, we have a number of customers who will go to liquid right away, right? Even when they don't necessarily need it, they just they find that it's um, better implementation, more consistent results, et cetera. So we, this is a polarizing topic for sure. 
we'd like now to present some of these trade-offs so that you can decide for your setup whether air cooling or liquid cooling is best for you in this range, you know, between, say, 250 watts and 600 watts. As we'll show you, once you get over 600 watts, you really need to start looking at a chiller-based solution or a liquid-based solution. So uh, let's talk liquid here. All right, so um, for applications where you know, the, the PCB is strictly constrained and you can't have a heat sink hanging over any of the PCB area, liquid cooling is probably going to be a good choice. Uh, in the upper left here, you see CAD model of uh, a test socket with a lid, and going into that lid are a couple of pipes, and there's literally a liquid pipe going in and liquid going out. Uh, this is a a lid design that we're actually seeing a lot of demand for right now, you know, it, making the lid that is simple, easy to use, easy to implement, and, and enables liquid cooling is proving to be very popular. Uh, if you have water in your lab, a lot of labs are already plumbed with the uh, uh, DI water. If you have a DI water line, implementing this kind of a, a thermal solution is really as simple as hooking up those lines, which we can design, build, and provide uh, to your water source. And if you, if you can do that, then, you know, your maintenance, your setup, your costs are all going to be very, very easy, very acceptable. Uh, if you don't have water in your lab or in your, on your test floor and you still want to use this kind of approach, uh, you can actually still do the same kind of cooling using a radiator to dissipate the heat instead of a, a liquid reservoir. So on the far right, what you're seeing is a, uh, a radiator solution that can attach in exactly the same way to the test socket using the, the liquid in, liquid out pipes. And it's just going to use a, a fan and, and a radiator setup to, to pull the heat out. If you go this route, it's important to bear in mind that the fluid temperature is always going to be above the ambient air temperature. So you can only, you know, dissipate so much heat this way. Uh, in, in our next section, Quinn's going to talk to you about a chiller where we can take that liquid temperature and lower it quite significantly. So from a design consideration standpoint, you, you do need to think about either your liquid reservoir's ability to dissipate heat or your radiator's ability to dissipate heat. Uh, in both these cases, uh, whether you're doing a water line or a radiator, the, the flow rate is probably going to be fixed, right? With a chiller, we can, we can adjust the flow rate. But with these setups, it's usually a consistent flow rate. And again, the temperature of the fluid is pretty, pretty consistent. But you can do a lot with this. Uh, in the simulation that we're showing you here, we're achieving a case temperature of 85 degrees C again. But in this case, we're just paid 500 watts with a very small, simple lid. And if you compare this to the 200 watt and the 250 watt heat sink that we showed you earlier, you can see that you can dissipate dramatically more power this way. And this is one of the main reasons that people are moving to this kind of stuff. But from the standpoint of liquid, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh -huh, sorry, so Quinn's gonna now show us uh, what we can do to extend these solutions. Quinn? All right. So as we uh, already discussed, uh, liquid cool heat sink can be used together with a chiller. Uh, the advantage of using a chiller is the fluid temperature can be set to a lower val value than ambient temperature. Um, the value can be, um, the temperature can be set to around 15 degrees or 10 degrees C. Uh, however, if you use at uh, 10 degrees C, then uh, condensation might occur. Um, uh, then um, we recommend to insulate the hose and then also add a cold system into the lid design. Um, the advantage of using a chiller is also you can use uh, multiple lids uh, connected to one chiller. Um, as long as the total uh, power dissipation of all lids uh, is below the cooling capability of that chiller. Um, below is a measurement, a lab measurement data that we use uh, when we uh, connect the lid into a chiller, and we set the temperature at 15 degrees C. Uh, during test, the device generates uh, up to 450 watts and the uh, uh, junction temperature is around uh, less than 70 degrees C. So at the loop, uh, water transfer heat better uh, than air around two times. Uh, therefore, liquid cool heating can dissipate greater than uh, 500 watts. Uh, when you use with a chiller, 
Now, fluid temperature can be set to lower than ambient temperature. Therefore, the cooling capability can go beyond uh, 600 watts or uh, up to 700 watts. Compared to heat pipe, uh, liquid cool heating uh, costs the less at low volume. Uh, if it is connected to a water line, then there's no maintenance required. Uh, also, uh, since the, um, there's no fan, uh, the noise level is minimal or no noise at all. Uh, if connected to a chiller or radiator, then it is recommended to change uh, coolant yearly. Um, the size and the weight of the liquid cool heating is lower than the conventional heating. Uh, if using the chiller or radiator, then the um, noise level of this unit is uh, much less than the um, typical uh, Heating um, that we seen earlier. So this unit, the noise level is around uh, 40 uh, decibel. Uh, when working with liquid, there are uh, concerns with potential leakage, uh, which will damage the test board and setup. Therefore, extreme caution must be taken during initial setup to detect for any leakage. Hey, Quinn. Hey, I, I got an audience question here. Um, have you experienced in any of these setups, have you ever seen an example where uh, one of these has leaked onto a customer setup? Um, usually uh, for our uh, setup, uh, for our lift, before we ship to customer, we do an internal test and we do the hydraulic test. So we test them at 90 PSI. Um, therefore, um, unless, um, the the there is like uh, carelessness in the um, setup. There should not be any leakage. So I have not heard any in the field um, that we see any leakage issue. Great, thank you. Do you speak from personal experience, Tim? Have you have you poured water onto a PCB? I I have. I'm not going to admit that here, especially in front of the audience, but. The pe people that are watching know, know for sure. They know me. <laughs> Very good. Okay, terrific. So uh, up until this point, uh, we've been talking about cooling solutions that are going to keep your device under test, your dot uh, temperature below a target maximum. And these are great solutions for simulating an end-use setup where your cooling system is going to do the same, right? Your, your graphics card is really only trying to just pull the heat away. But for some applications, uh, particularly when you're doing characterization work, uh, engineers are going to need to control the dot inside a narrow range of temperatures, so both above a minimum threshold and below a maximum threshold. For these applications, you need what we call an active uh, thermal control solution. Uh, these solutions can push heat to the device as well as pulling heat to the, from the device. And we're, we're typically using a, a Peltier thermoelectric device. Tim is going to tell us about uh, how we do that. Great. Uh, so just for the, the sake of the webinar, this is a, an oversimplified view, but uh, a heat sink can be used with a controller to create an active temperature control unit, or what we refer to as a TCU. Uh, this can be used as a standalone single site setup, and that's starting to be installed and carried over into the auto handler for production device testing. Uh, the advantage of using a controller is that the heat sink can be used for tri-temp testing, which is cooling, heating, or static thermal cycling. Uh, the cooling is achieved by air cooling or liquid cooling the heat sink connected to a chiller or condenser. Uh, the heating is achieved by a TC or heating rods installed within the heat sink. And to monitor the temperature at the contact surface between the chip and the heat sink, there's either a resistance temperature detector or RTD, a thermocouple, or a thermostat for temperature feedback. Uh, the case temperature of the chip is read and fed back to a controller. The controller then regulates the chiller or the heater rod uh, for cooling or heating modes. And this is outlined in the diagram in the top left. Uh, as you can see here, we have a, a 
laptop that's connected to the controller. Controller is connected to the TEC. The TEC is sandwiched in between the pedestal and the heat sink. Uh, the heat sink is hooked up to a chiller and the RTD or thermal couple is embedded within uh, the pedestal itself. Uh, and then also in the image on the right or below that, we could see the TEC, uh, which is sandwiched between the heat heat sink above and the pedestal below. And this is actually connected to a, a chiller in this particular application. So the TCU has similar advantages to liquid cooling with the addition of the tri-temp or thermal cycle testing with multiple set, set points based on a customer test profile and can be integrated into your test program um, and can communicate via uh, multiple COM ports on the controller itself. Uh, the initial cost for an active thermal control system is higher than passive for liquid cooling or even a heat pipe solution. Uh, this is due to the additional cost of the chiller, the controller, the heater rods, TECs, and so on. Uh, if the TCU uses a thermoelectric unit for heating, then it has the possibility for higher maintenance. And this is just because the TEC can break down due to um, rapid voltage um, being applied to the TEC itself. Uh, the advantage of the TEC is that uh, for in-use applications, it's it's really quite substantial from zero to even up to 800 watts uh, in the field today. So it, it seems to be a, a pretty good solution for uh, quite a few of our customers that are testing in the, the 400 and up watt range. So. All right, thank you, Tim. So everything that we've showed you so far, the, the air-cooled solutions with heat sinks and fans, extending that with heat pipes and vapor chambers, the new liquid cooling solutions that we're seeing, uh, this stuff is becoming very quickly established. Next, we wanna talk about what we're seeing in the future. And this is some crazy stuff. Um, we're actually seeing customers immersing their systems fully in liquid. And, and Quinn's gonna to describe to you that Today, this is mostly things that people are doing in the data center and advanced research uh, uh, spaces, but we are seeing some of this migrate into test. And we do believe that as the cost of the materials and these setups come down, we're probably gonna see more of this. So we wanna get ready for it. And as Quinn's gonna show you at Smith's Interconnect, we've actually already designed test sockets that are going into a full liquid bath. And there's some interesting design trade-offs around that. So Quinn's gonna tell us a little bit about that. Um, that's right. So recently, there are increasing uh, interest in two-phase liquid cool, uh, immersion cooling. Uh, however, at this time, we see seen it uh, most used in the uh, cooling data center. Uh, recently, the crypto mining uh, group also um, starting to use it, and some of the gamers uh, who go radical and change their uh, chassis into a, 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 a but uh, so what is a liquid cool uh, immersion cooling? Um, so on the lower uh, right hand side is a system and close it and fill with the non-conductive, uh, non-corrosive fluid. Uh, one of such fluid is the Novik uh, 7500 uh, engineering fluid. Um, this um, process is um, the heat dissipation is through evaporation and condensation. Um, this fluid uh, has a low constant boiling temperature. Therefore, if the temperature of the chip rise, uh, the boiling vapor of the fluid will rise to the condenser uh, at the top of the uh, chamber. And that condenser have uh, facility water running through it. Uh, so the uh, condensed fluid, um, uh, the condensed fluid will return back to the uh, uh, 
to the tank and uh, repeat the cycle. Uh, upper left hand side, you see that a uh, system we developed for immersion cooling. Mm. Uh, this lid, it has a low profile so that we can stack many uh, PCB tested up into that uh, uh, liquid bath. Um, and then at the same time, it has a large opening to ensure that most surface of the heat source is uh, as close as possible. Uh, with the immersed cooling, uh, liquid make direct contact to the chip surface. Thus, the heat transfer is efficient and believed to be a thousand times better than air. Uh, since no fan is used, the system will have less noise. Uh, the fluid is non-conductive, non-corrosive, so there's no special wiring or re uh, host routing is required. Uh, the maintenance cost is low if the system is already set up. Um, we only need to replace or refill the fluid to maintain a certain, a certain level for testing. However, to convert the conventional test setup that we have right now to immersion cooling, the initial cost for the setup would be high um, since we need to you know, modify the test band uh, to fit inside the te uh, test bag. Fluid in the test bath evaporates with time, so uh, present uh, refilling is, of the fluid is necessary. Uh, therefore, spillage is possible, and thus uh, trim costs are needed for the safety of the uh, um, user and others. So uh, to sum up, uh, here's a table showing you the various aspects of different cooling strategy. As uh, you can see, there are a variety of cost, uh, performance, and conven uh, conven uh, convenient factor uh, to consider. Uh, when you are ready for your next project, uh, please give uh, Rick or Tim a call, and then we will help you find the best solution for your setup. All right. Thank you, Quinn. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, just a quick overview for you on uh, some of the products that Smith Interconnect provides. So we we design custom test sockets and lids, and you know one of the main things we're doing these days are integrated liquid cooled lids, like we showed you in, during the liquid section. Uh, we do have a variety of test socket solutions and thermal solutions across a, across the test space here. I do want to highlight a couple of new uh, innovations that we have here. Our DaVinci high-speed array series is really being used heavily by our customers for these very high-speed interfaces. Uh, we're working on chips, as I mentioned, that have 50 billion transistors and also have very high-speed uh, single-ended memory clocks for uh, the new GDDR6X interface, uh, as well as very high-speed SERTES interfaces. You know, 56 gigabit per second we're seeing all over the place today, as well as 112 gigabit per second PAM4. Um, those big chips generate a ton of heat, and so one of our big advantages with DaVinci is that the socket is a metal socket body. It's extremely rigid, has tremendously good performance in a, in a harsh operating environment. And we do have customers that will run a system level test application where the device may output 450 watts and maybe under load for 30 minutes of test time or 40 minutes of test time. It is incredibly punishing to the, the test socket and the spring probes. Uh, the next generation of our DaVinci is uh, this DaVinci Micro that you see in the center of the slide. Well, as we mentioned, a lot of these devices now that are high power are starting to go into smaller and smaller packages. So DaVinci Micro can take you down to 0.5 millimeter, 0.4 millimeter, 0.3 millimeter. Uh, in the lower left, we're also excited that we've got a new QFM testing solution. This can be a drop-in replacement if you've got uh, any, any kind of QFN, uh, DFN, QFP, SOC type uh, application. And as we described today, we're consistently expanding our thermal solution. So if any of this stuff is of interest or use to you, please drop us a note. We'd be happy to send you, you know, lots, lots more information about it. So now we're excited to get to Q&A. We've got a number of good questions that come in. I think Jonathan is going to take us through uh, uh, some of the top questions. Jonathan? Perfect. Thank you very much for that, Rick. 
So just a reminder for the audience, in order to ask any questions, you can send them in via the questions widget. Just type them into the box at the top corner of your screen and click Submit. So we already have some questions here, the first of which being, can your lids add heat so that you can test the device at a higher temperature? Uh, yeah, I'll take that one, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, that's a, a really good question. You know, as we're seeing more and more requests for cooling lids, we're actually also testing what is module devices, and customers are asking us to not only cool the lid, but add, in some cases, heat back into the lid because they can't generate enough heat to uh, characterize the uh, module for automotive applications. And we have done a passive heating solution, but it, it still requires a controller. Uh, it is not a active cooling, but we are embedding heater rods into the heat sink to help assist bring the modules up to temperature. Uh, and we're starting to see that more and more. Perfect. Thank you very much for that answer. And we have another question here. How much force is used and any TIM used? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to take this one, too, because I think I, I know where this question came from. And he told me he was going to sleep in, so I didn't expect him to answer, ask a question. But, uh, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, as we, kind of what we talked about at the beginning, as we're having smaller device sizes um, that are double and triple the watt density of the previous generation device, we're, we're finding that uh, having to smaller surface area to touch on um, exposed dye is having us uh, to model an increased force where traditionally we were at limits and, and concerned about breaking uh, dot or cracking dot and you know that that number is creeping up so uh, the 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 model is really the dictator for that and uh, I, I'm pretty sure that the, the person that asked this question is is uh, working with me on it right now. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much for that answer there. And we have another question for you all. How does modeling use the comparison data between experimental and simulation data in order to make more accurate simulations? Um, I think I will take this one. Um, so for the, uh, when we do the, uh, modeling the for the simulation and then we, when we do the measurement, the actual measurement, we compare the value and then adjust the parameter within the simulation to get a better result. However, uh, we tend to stay on the uh, positive side of the, um, the gap. Um, like for example, before we uh, compare the heat pipe um, simulation, we say that there is a 13% variation we try to stay within around uh, from 15 to 20 percent, and do not want to go um, uh, on the negative side because when the simulation show that it is supposed to meet a certain temperature, if it go on the negative side, which means that it fails. I hope that will answer the question. Thank you very much for that answer there. So just a reminder for the audience that you can still submit questions. Just type them into the questions with it at the top corner of your screen. And we have another question here. Whenever you use a heat pipe, do you always use a vapor chamber pipe, or do you sometimes expect a solid copper pipe to allow the benefit? I, so I'll, I'll jump in on that one again. Or you want, you want to take it, Clint? Uh, go ahead, Tim. I'll take it. Okay. okay. Yeah, so I, you know, when we're uh, when we're qualifying a product and a customer request, you know, we will take the information provided by the customer, and if we can achieve um, the solution based on heat pipe technology, we, we would prefer to use phase change technology just because we can remove uh, 
keep from a condensed area and go vertical with it rather quickly without retaining the heat in a solid block. Um, but, you know, again, this is based on, on modeling because there is points when a heat pipe can be ineffective, um, for instance, if if it's modeled for a 300 watt system and we're at it's really effective from zero to 280 watts and then the the last 20 watts it 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 can be it just needs to be optimized the heat pipe length and fins to uh pull that last 20 percent so there there is some nuance and uh modeling that has to happen it's it's not just a black or white question and i i, I hope that that helps uh, answer that question. Perfect. Thank you very much for that answer. And we have another question here. What are the main cooling liquids being pumped through these tubes? I have heard of Novec. Is this common? You said DI water, but wondering what other chemicals are common. Okay. <laughs> so I, I I, I jump in from this one then. Uh, typically, um, water has the, is the most efficient. However, if you use only water, then it has a bio buildup, and then you see that uh, green uh, green stuff around the hose, so it's not good. Uh, therefore, they add some chemical uh, to keep uh, the, the the fluid from getting uh, bio buildup. And uh, the most commonly used one is the uh, propylene uh, glycol. So uh, it, they, they add a small amount of that uh, chemical into the DI to prevent the bio buildup. Uh, as for the uh, the Novec, um, I think Novec is um, better if you have like direct contact. Uh, if you go through a tube, then um, that fluid is, is is not typically used. Perfect. Thank you very much for that answer there. And we have another question here. What are the max temperatures you are being asked to mitigate with your customers? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll take that, Joseph. Uh, I'll take it. Perfect. Too. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a really interesting question. Um, it, Tim described in his intro that you know we're seeing this expansion of devices that are that are drawing a huge amount of power, and it's really important to differentiate that. Most of these devices are devices that are performance at any cost, right? The uh, the modern uh, AI accelerators that companies like AMD and NVIDIA, um, uh, you know, Ampere, GraphCore, et cetera, that these guys are building, they just do not care about the power draw or the thermal output. The goal is performance, 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 right? Do, do the most you can to, to boost that inference engine. As a result, uh, we are seeing power uh, demands creep up well beyond the 600, 700 watts that we talked about today. Uh, we've, we've got real live customer devices uh, that are being uh, requested to dissipate 1,000 watts. Uh, typically, the good news is that these are larger packages. These are typically 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter packages that do incorporate a heat spreader already into their standard packaging technology. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're not talking about power density of 1,000 watts in a 50-millimeter package, but there's more coming. Um, the the multi-chip modules that Tim mentioned are already showing up, and right now we've got a customer request on the horizon for a multi-chip module that's a, a dual, dual core, so two huge cores in one package. It looks like it's going to be about 1,200 watts, so it, we do not expect this to slow down. We We think that you know, greater than a thousand watts is just going to be a reality in six to twelve months' time. Perfect. Thank you very much for that answer there. And it looks like we have another question here. And this question reads: What do you recommend the TIM, which is able to rework? Um, well, I recommend myself. Sorry. Oh, Go ahead. They meant thermal interface. They meant thermal interface material, not. Which Tim? Sorry, Quinn, you can answer this now. Um, currently, we use the uh, um, the Fuji Poly, uh, which is we uh, we attach it to the lid, and it can be um, used multiple uh, use. 
However, any replaceable team, uh, you will also need to have a preference um, change out because um, the more you use, then the performance will be degraded. And I, I just one one note on top of that. I, I think we're starting to see uh, indium and indium heat spring and uh, indium foil uh, be more uh, of an option in these smaller packages, right? Right. Um, okay. But then, um, yeah, so, some customer prefer not to use indium um, due to the chemical uh, composition of it. Yeah, good point. Perfect. Thank you very much both for that answer. So it looks like that's all the time we have for today. So thank you very much to everyone. And just a reminder, if you didn't get your question answered today, they will be available to be answered in the coming days. So that just leaves me to thank Rick, Tim, and Quinn for what was a great presentation, and to Smith's Interconnect for sponsoring the session. To all of the attendees, you'll receive an email shortly telling you how you can access the on-demand version of this webinar, or you can access this through our website, which is www.business-review-webinars.com. We look forward to sharing further webinars with you, so please do keep an eye out on the website just mentioned and follow us on Twitter at BR Webinars for daily updates and join our LinkedIn group, Business Review Webinars. Thank you all once again, and I hope you all have a very nice day.